Hey everybody, happy Friday afternoon. I am so excited to be here today with three of my favorite people. Uh, we are tasting three wines today from each one of our states and I have the privilege uh, to introduce to you the people who make them. My name is Sandra Roberts. I'm director of sales for Cade, Plump Jack, and Odette. And to the left of me here are Aaron Miller. He's winemaker at Plump Jack Estate in Oakville. Next to Aaron, my friend Danielle Sabro. She's winemaker at Cade Estate up on Howl Mountain. And just to the left of me is Jeff Owens. He's our winemaker here at Odette Estate. And I know you're worried. I wanted to let everyone know we are all fully vaccinated. Uh, so don't be concerned. Welcome. Yay. Yeah, yeah, excited to be here. Well, ha happy, to, happy to be here at your winery, Jeff. Thanks for having us. Beautiful backdrop, energy in the vineyards, life, bud break. A lot it's going on. Good times. So number one, I want to say thanks to you guys uh, who purchased the wines to enjoy with us today. Thank you to our club members. Um, I say it all the time, I'll say it again, we don't get to do this without you. Um, all the work that these guys put in into making these wines mean nothing if you don't enjoy them. So I'm going to remind you of this one thing before we get started. It's Friday, y'all. Open a bottle. And in fact, I would encourage you to open two bottles because we have sent you cork and screw cap finish. It's one of the things that we're known for, being the crazy people who put reserve cabin screw cap in 1997. Yeah. Um, so it'll be a fun tasting for you if you can join <clears throat> us in it. Uh, you guys, you're all making wine from three different estates. Um, what's, what's, your, what's your general philosophy and how do you work together? I'll, I'll ask that first. Do you guys collaborate? Danielle, start with the lady. Yeah, we do. And that I have two amazing palettes right here that I get to um, say, here's a, here's a wine, here's a blend. What do you think? And I get this um, honest, truthful, um, and you know the best experts in Napa Valley telling you, this is what I taste in your wine, and this is what works, and this is what doesn't work. So I think that's um, you know, the best tool to have with working with, with Jeff and Aaron is their palates. Yeah, amazing. How about, how about you, Aaron? Yeah, I agree. I, I think that I have basically two consulting winemakers in-house, uh, and it makes my job a lot easier. Uh, it helps me to... Uh, kind of tease out some ideas, um, maybe tease out some blends, or if I'm having any issues in the cellar with any of the wines, uh, I have a lot of expertise uh, in-house that I can consult. Uh, so it's uh, a huge advantage. Do you feel the same way, Jeff? Agreed, yes. So not only two palettes, but two sounding boards. So yeah, we could definitely bounce ideas off each other and get some feedback and collaborate. And it doesn't just have to be me, but um, it's nice to have other options for But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the buck stop, stops with you, right? right. For your yes. winery. Sure, yeah. I mean, I might tell Aaron, I like this blend better, and he'll be like, well, I'm gonna do this. And that's what he gets to do as winemaker. Yeah. That's his right, so. I think one of the really neat stories, one of my favorite stories, is about barrels. <laughs> you know yes. where I'm at? Yes. Miss Danielle. I don't know, if y'all haven't been to see Danielle Cellar, she is a big fan of French oak. You have 53 different types of French oak barrel. Um, but she has one favorite. Darnajou. Oh. Yes. And are those easy to get? They are not. They're allocated. And yeah, um, Vincent Darnajou, the, the head cooper, came. And we tasted. And um, I really wanted to up my allocation. So, you know, I, I tried to roll out the red carpet for him and, and you know, praise him with how amazing the, the wines um, tasted in his barrels. And, you know, I made sure it was uh, the best of the best and everything. And at the end of our tasting, I said, and, you know, Mr. Donahue, it would be amazing if we could get it more of an allocation of barrels. And he said, you'll receive your allocation in a few weeks by letter. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, you know, and the letter arrived a few weeks later and it was exactly the same. Not a barrel book. It had failed. Nothing in my, you know, my attempt at uh, seducing him did not work at all. 
So um, then I, I went to Jeff and I was like, Jeff, what, what's your allocation? And uh, we, we made a little trade. It so, worked out um, for both of us. Yeah, it, it worked for both of us. So I, I traded some Terran, so Jeff gave me some Darnajou, and we were both very happy. So Good. I think that's a great <laughs> benefit. Yeah. One of the things I say all the time is our culture is that each one of you are charged with really lifting your place to its highest potential. What would you say, what's the difference between you know, Stag's Leap District, Oakville, and Howe Mountain? <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's huge differences, and the, the primary difference, obviously, is just the location. That's, you know, that is the difference, is the location. But the, but the location gives us uh, kind of different advantages and different characters and different uh, expressions in our wines. Uh, for example. For, for many reasons. Uh, for, you know, for example, Valley Floor. Plum Jack is on the Valley Floor. We're on the, on the east side of the valley and we're next to the mountain range, and so we have a lot of you know, runoff from the mountain range, a lot of uh, soil from the mountain range. So the closer you get to the mountains, you, the more rock you get. And as you go further away, you get less rock. And, and those, so there's different soil profiles within the estate that give us a huge range of flavors in the, in the wine. What uh, flavors would you say I would find in this Plump Jack Cabernet that I'm about to enjoy? Uh, well. It, this, so this is the 2018 vintage, and uh, I, I find in this wine you get a lot of uh, a whole range of fruits. And there's a lot of layers of fruits from blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, cherries. Uh, really nice ripe fruit character, um, a, a nice brightness to the fruit, fresh fruit. Uh, there's also really nice um, some just underneath subtle herbal notes, mint, uh, a little bit of sage. Uh, the palate is really concentrated and rich. But there's also some elegance to the palate as well. You get a lot of concentration from those rockier soils, a lot of tannin, a lot of structure, a lot of, a lot of uh, depth. And then when you go further out into those less rocky soils, you get more acid and more, and that gives us more length on the palate and more, more of that freshness. Uh, one and of so the things I the, love about this wine, Aaron, is the, that balance that you strike between acidity and richness. Is that your is that your uh, imprint on the wine, or is that coming from the vineyard? Well, there's, it's both. There's a nice natural acidity in the wine, in those grapes, uh, and there's also a really nice structure. Uh, my job is to coax that out. You know, just make sure I get the the right amount of structure, get the tannin that I want, uh, get the color that I want, uh, and and leave behind what I don't want uh, in the grape, and and also um, picking at the right time so that I don't lose acid because as the grapes ripen you you lose more and more acid and if you pick too late uh, then you can you can lose some of that acidity and freshness as well uh, so a lot of it has to do with you know, what we start with with the grapes but then in the cellar you have to make the right decisions as well and in the vineyard sure what about now danielle how mountain a lot different from the valley floor yeah and mm -hmm. one of the things people talk about up there is tannin uh, but these wines I'm going to taste this to be certain. Um, <laughs> don't have that big tannic um, nature that you would expect. Can you talk a little bit about how Mountain and what you do up there to, to tame it? Yeah, well, um, you're right in that the grapes grown up on Howe Mountain, you can taste the tannin literally when you, when you taste the fruit. Um, and so we have to treat those grapes a little bit different in the cellar and through um, the fermentation process to help us achieve that balance in structure and tannin. So um, we bring in the fruit, we do these um, hot, fast, crazy extractions, crazy fermentations, and then we press the juice away from the source of tannin, the skins and seeds early, so that we don't, we stop extracting all of the tannin from the grapes. So um, sometimes we, we get it just perfectly. We're like, yeah, we nailed it. Other times we, we sh you know, just overshot it and we get too much tannin. Um, but if I do that, then I can make the next pick, the next lot, um, a little bit smaller. And we utilize a laboratory that kind of helps us um, see what's happening chemically with the juice as it's fermenting so we can make changes instantly um, and that might be doing less pump overs 
um, or cooling the fermentation down to slow the extraction of the tannin or simply just pressing the juice away from the source. So um, it's a great tool to kind of help us see what's happening as the, in the juice as it's fermenting because um, during fermentation it's still very sweet uh, of the natural sugars from the grape and it's really hard to taste tannin under all of that sugar. Right. And so sometimes you can taste it as it's fermenting and go, oh, it tastes great, it's amazing keep it on for another day, and then as that sugar goes down and the alcohol comes up and you taste it, it's <clears throat> becoming more dry, you go, oh, wait, there's all the tannin. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And then you kind of have a problem that you have to then fix later I on. I think a lot about when, when you say hot, fast ferments, um, from a non-wine wine maker point of view, is pulling that tannin from the skins and the seeds, uh, from the skins rather than the seeds. So you're getting kind of right. this this uh, chewy, sweet tannin, not a bitterness. And right. I think that's where you really nail it in this wine, is you're getting that, that unctuous tannin, nothing bitter, nothing drying in your palate. Nice work. Thank you. And uh, Jeff, how about here in Stags Lake yes. District? How's that different from Oakville, Howe Mountain? So we are in the smallest sub-ABA out of all the different sub-ABAs within the broader Napa Valley. Um, we're also in a cooler region, so as you head south towards the San Pablo Bay, um, it gets a little bit cooler and cooler, and we also do have that influence every day too, so we get that breeze that comes in 2, 3 p.m. every day, which I think really helps slow down the ripening, um, helps retain a lot of the freshness and the acidity. I think one of the things that I love about this site is the acidity. Mm -hmm. So we do have uh, an abundance of tannin, and so we do kind of use some of the same similar approaches in winemaking with the hot, fast fermentations. Um, because we have the influence from the Vaca uh, mountain range. And so that coupled with wind in the afternoon thickens the skins. We have a lot of tannins. So we want to make sure that we don't over extract. Um, so it's kind of that combination of, well, like I always say, always say, power and finesse, bold yet elegant. Well, uh, you've said before, velvet, iron fist, velvet glove. It's the glove. old district saying, is yeah. the iron fist and the velvet glove. I'm picking up what you're laying down. <laughs> it's delicious. So off topic, off, off winemaking, but just from a personal standpoint, you know, what, what do you guys admire about each other? What, what are some of the things you've learned from one another? Like, I'll start with you, Jeff, even though you just took a sip. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, everybody, you talked about culture, and yeah. I think that everybody fits in within the culture here. Everybody has a great personality. They're friendly. They're open. Um, you guys have incredible knowledge, also incredible palates. And so just the idea um, of being able to go there and, and trust in them and um, being able to gain additional knowledge or bounce blends off, et cetera, uh, is always amazing. So, yeah, having people that I can, I can trust in is probably the most important thing. One of the things we do here that I love, we have a contest at our staff meetings. It's Got Your Back, Jack, and we nominate one another for things that, that you've done out of, not out of necessity, but because you wanted to do um, to help one another. And I think that's just a really cool part about our culture. So Danielle, what do you admire about these, these guys on your left and right? Well, um, I have two quick stories. One, you know, in 2020, um, we had some fires up uh, in Napa Valley and especially around Cade. And the first fire that hit, um, basically we had no access to the winery. I needed to bring in Sauvignon Blanc. I went to Aaron, I was like, can I use your winery, um, use your press, and we'll press some SB. And him and his team just totally embraced us and we're like, yeah, let's do this. And we all worked um, really well together and I was just super impressed by your great team with Courtney and Josh. Um, and, you know, saving the vintage, basically. And, I w and Jeff would have let me come there too, um, <laughs> for sure. But, it was um, an open door. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, Plum Jack was closer. Plum Jack was closer, yeah. Um, and I, you know, this year we've also been doing a lot of bottling with our own teams and really um, coming together as a, as a team of production, Cade, Plum Jack, and Odette all working together. Um, Jeff has an amazing team with him, with Andrew and Marnie. Um, I 
dumped glass with Marnie um, on bottling, and she just is a powerhouse. She is amazing, and I was so impressed with her. Now, what and, does dumped glass mean? Oh, you know, you, technical that's one like, term. Yeah, that's maybe, that is kind of a technical, sorry. We got a little too personal there. Um, empty glass goes on the bottling line, and it's packed in the Kate cardboard boxes, and you have to kind of slap it on a table lift the cardboard box up and then the gla empty glass goes onto the line and feeds the line. So I just want to point out that that doesn't, our winemakers <laughs> and our very tiny staff are bottling our own wine. That I, I've had people joke with me, you know, how, do you have a bottling line? And I say, well, no, we, we bottle, you know, a day for each wine that we make in general. Um, and to know that y'all are doing your own bottling is, is pretty crazy. So you're really <laughs> watching this, the, these wines from grape to the bottle, literally. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, how, how about you, Aaron? Do you admire anything about these two? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, I, I, I think they have a similar philosophy in winemaking to me, and I think that's why we all work so well together. Uh, I think we all have a, this philosophy where we, we just want to make a wine that really uh, is distinguishable. Uh, it, it represents the place that it's from. Uh, it represents the, the time that it's from. Um, you know, they, and, and they as winemakers and myself as winemakers, I, I say we're, like, we're really winemakers. We get in the cellar and we work alongside our team. Uh, and we, we do all the work um, alongside one another or with our teams. And, and, and a good example of that is what Daniel was just talking about with, uh, with bottling, just all of us getting in there uh, and doing all, the, all just the, those laborious tasks that are you know, really <clears throat> quite mundane and boring and <clears throat> just takes a long time. But, but it's actually been a lot of fun. We've been doing this because of, uh, of COVID restrictions and not bringing in um, uh, outside vendors, but uh, outside uh, contractors, <clears throat> but uh, it, but it's been a, a great like bonding, you know, with, with our whole teams, and that's been a lot of fun uh, to get to know everybody a little better, you know, as we've been growing as a company, uh, we we tend to kind of uh, go astray and lose a little bit of that, and this has brought it all back together, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, well, I think one of the things I admire most is their, their, their philosophy and their approach to winemaking and um, uh, just the, the passion that they have for, for what they do. Um, it's, it makes it a lot more fun when, you have, when you're working together to people, with people that are similarly minded. Totally. And, and, yeah. and wines that you can really be proud of. Yeah. Um, I have stories about all y'all, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, some of my favorites are Aaron. I remember being at your house for a dinner on a Saturday night for fun. And I could see you really thinking, and um, you can see Aaron think. Uh, <laughs> and and you said you y'all you and your wife y'all had just put the kids to bed, and there were several people over, and you said, "Okay, I've got I'll be right back." And I said, "Where are you going? It's raining. It's cold outside. Uh, it's Saturday night. You know things are about to just get super fun, and we're going to tell jokes and laugh and tell stories." And you said, "I just have to go check on the Chardonnay." I, I just, I mean, that is something that is intrinsic to a person, to care that much. And uh, Danielle, yeah. I mean, I, to I touched on 53 different barrels, <laughs> but um, that kind of attention to detail in, in, in your oak process is unheard of, really. And one of the stories, my favorite story is about you. I saw you walking through the cellar with a thief. That's how they get the wine out of the barrel to taste. And I said, what are you doing? Are you sampling, you know, barrels? And she said, no, I'm tasting every barrel. I'm tasting every barrel before it becomes part of this Cabernet. Amazing. And Jeff, when we first bought this property, Jeff uh, had, had kind of grown up with, with Plump Jack and Cade and started here right after college, mm -hmm. worked his way up. When we opened Odette, he chose to come here, even though it was really unknown. I think that's super brave. Um, and his first vintage did 28 picks in 30 acres. It's the magical number. That might be kind of a... <laughs> Crazy attention to detail, <laughs> but all three of those are examples, just one example of many of, of why our wines are great. Yeah, it's y'all are the secret sauce. Like you said, yeah. it's, it's in the details. Yeah. And we don't overlook yeah. those. We all, we, all uh, we, we, we love our wine and these are, you know, we take ownership of, mm -hmm. of the wines and what we're doing and, 
And so we put everything we have into, into crafting the best wines we can make. And every year our goal is to make it better than the last, you know, learn from last year's mistakes and, and, uh, and get advice and uh, feedback from, from Jeff and Danielle. And uh, so, you know, so that we can always move forward and keep making better wines and better yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a unique tasting here today. So we have uh, two of each of your wines, both Estate Cab. Aaron, yours is the 18 Plump Jack Estate. Mm -hmm. Danielle, yours is 17 Cade Estate, because of course we tend to hold Howl Mountain a little bit longer. And then Jeff, yours is the 18 Odette Estate. Uh, one screw cap, one cork. So I think maybe we should talk a little bit about why did we choose to put our 1997 Plump Jack Reserve Cab in screw cap, Aaron? And then maybe Danielle, we could talk a little bit about the Davis study. Yeah. And then Jeff, you've, you've been here since, since we've been doing those crazy things. So I'd love to hear <laughs> all your opinions on these two closures and what you think works better. And Okay, well, I've, I mean, I've heard a few stories about uh, the kind of the genesis of the screw cap at Plump Jack, but uh, the one that I've heard the most and that I, that I like the best is uh, <clears throat> Years ago, in the late 90s, when um, uh, we had the Plump Jack Cafe in San Francisco, and, and Gordon Getty, one of our founders, uh, had some of his buddies, they all went to the Plump Jack Cafe uh, to have some dinner and drink some wine. Gordon brought a bottle that he'd been holding for a little while, I think it was, from what I understand, that 1946 Cheval Blanc, uh, which is like the, the wine of forever. You know, like that's if you ever, if you, it's, I don't know, like you'll never, ever, ever have this wine, you know, and none of us will ever have this wine. Uh, it, it's like even for, for Gordon to have this wine is impossible, but he had the wine and there was so much hype and excitement around it. And they popped it open, poured the wine, and they smelled it, and it was cork tainted. The wine's uh. ruined. <clears throat> it was ruined in what, 1946. They probably bottled it in 1948, 49, and the moment they put the cork in it, it was ruined. It was ruined. Uh, Cause the cork take is, comes from the cork and the cork put, imparted these terrible aromas in the wine and flavors in the wine. And, um, and of course everybody was disappointed. You know, they, there was so much hype around that. And so what Gordon asked, he is a very practical man, why does the wine industry accept this kind of failure? When at that time it was predicted that, or estimated that six, seven, eight percent of all wines uh, bottled in the U.S. were cork tainted. I mean, that's one out of twelve. Well, it's one bottle per case. It's yeah. amazing. Right. Yeah. So, too much. So that drove this question: you know, what what should the industry do? What could the industry do? How could we change? And uh, ultimately, uh, we decided to use the screw cap as an alternative closure to the cork. And, uh, and it kind of as an experiment, as a trial, to see how this goes. But Gordon being Gordon, didn't put it into the estate cab or Merlot. He bottled half of the reserve under screw cap and the other half under cork. And that, that's, the, uh, that's our great experiment. Yeah, at the time, back in 1999, we bottled it. They said, they, the collective, they said, red wines would not age under screw cap. Um, well, Danielle, what's the near finding about that? Has that been true? Well, no, not at all. <laughs> um, we actually did some studies with UC Davis, and we um, donated 600 bottles of Sauvignon Blanc, that 200 had been bottled under cork, 200 under screw cap, and 200 under a synthetic closure. And then what UC Davis did is looked at each individual bottle over time, over a period of two years, and looked at the change in color of the wine without having to open the bottle of wine. They were able to just put it on a spectrophotometer, basically, um, and look at the change in color, which as a wine ages and as it's exposed to oxygen, it will get more brown in color, and that can be measured. And so we got all this great data from UC Davis, and we were able to chart it out and look at it, and we saw that screw caps are actually really reliable, consistent closures, and every single <clears throat> bottle outside of you know, a, a couple of outliers aged the same 
in time, meaning very little oxygen ingress and very little change in color. Um, and the same was true for synthetic closures. They've actually improved quite a bit since 1997 sure. when we um, were bottling the plump jack. And so um, synthetics showed very similar to screw caps. The interesting part was the cork finish closure and that we saw wildly different um, oxygen ingress. And um, we saw some bottles that performed just like screw cap but some that had huge oxygen in ingress, a mm -hmm. lot of browning, mm -hmm. and some that were very tight closures, almost less oxygen ingress than the screw cap or um, synthetic. So what that tells me as a winemaker is that corks are kind of a, an unknown. They're a little right. bit of a crapshoot. You don't know what you're gonna get. You might get a perfect closure, but you might not. And, and, and that is a problem because we want, as winemakers, every single bottle to be consistent and taste the same. And so when you get a different wine, um, because of the closure, you kind of think, well, maybe there's something wrong with this philosophy of it must be bottled under cork. Right. We've proved that screw caps are actually a great alternative. Um, you don't have to worry about cork taint, one, but also, they're a, um, a great seal, and mm -hmm. they age your wine really well, and yeah. almost better, in my opinion, than cork. Well, they age more slowly, no? They can, yeah, and that's um, based on the liner um, that you choose. So Plum Jack and Odette both use a um, tin liner, which basically doesn't allow any oxygen ingress. Um, at Cade, we use the Saranex liner, which does allow a little bit of oxygen ingress, um, but I find that that's better suited to Cade and Howl Mountain sure. wines. Um, but, you know, still the, we know exactly, if any, um, how much is coming in via the closure, whereas cork is a little bit of an unknown. I don't know, the question I always ask is, I mean, who wants to age faster? <laughs> so, but, but Jeff, you've had probably, the, you've been here the longest of, of, any, of yes. any of us, really. Yeah. What, what are your feelings? You've probably had the most compared between screw cap and cork. Yeah, so, you know, having the opportunity to go back and taste some of these wines from the very first vintage and starting off and, um, you know, we did these blind tests uh, with what's called the duo trio test. So you have uh, two of the same and one's, one that's different. Yeah. So two yeah. can be cork. Uh, one could be screw cap or vice versa. And so, it really messes with you. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> so the whole purpose is to be able to, to blind taste and see if you can pick out a difference. And so we've gone through numerous tastings and oftentimes we can't find a difference at all, um, which is a great result because it, it tells you that screw cap is in the conversation yeah. and then it competes and then it can age well. Yeah. And so we've found that a lot. We've also found that sometimes the corks are a little bit prematurely oxidized and mm -hmm. more advanced. Mm -hmm. And that becomes obvious when you have something that's super far advanced and um, maybe a little bit oxidized and then the screw cap in comparison would be very fresh. And so obviously it would be better to have something that's on the fresher side mm -hmm. and still has a lot of life left mm -hmm. rather than something that's advanced and um, kind of aging before, before it's time. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's been uh, very interesting to be able to taste those wines over time. And, and the best thing ever, like Aaron was alluding to, you're not going to have court tape. Yeah. I mean, that is the ultimate worst thing ever yeah. to be... Yeah. Yep. Saving a bottle, looking forward to it, yep. getting to that moment, popping the cork. I mean, corks are awesome for the oh, romantic part. It's heartbreaking. The ceremony and all that, I totally get it. But when it's cork tainted and it's in the glass and you've been waiting for that. Yeah, that's, people that's say all the time, oh, but pulling a cork is romantic. And I say, you know what's not romantic? <laughs> cork taint. Yes. Not romantic. <laughs> well, you've had more, again, than anyone. Do you think that at a certain, if they're similar in the beginning, is there a certain time frame when they start to diverge in terms of freshness? They could, depending on the cork, and that's when it goes back to screw caps being manufactured and being a little bit more consistent, mm -hmm. and then cork is natural, so there's some variability there. Yeah. You could have what's called the perfect cork. It's not yeah. really going to have any ingress of oxygen, or you might have a cork that's a little bit more porous, and that, so that can would age explain. faster, so you don't really yeah. know until you get to that point. That but would depending explain. on the cork, it, it can be more or less yep. obvious. Explains why in a case of six or 12, one might test it, yeah. Do we have any questions from the audience? I'm asking all the questions. So this is more of a comment uh, than a question from Dave Wheeler. 
He said, the most recent discussion regarding the extra efforts of the panelists is also consistent with your team. I work with Zoe Gallup, and she also exemplifies the same culture of quality, responsiveness, and attention to making the Plum Jack family experience a great one. Well done. Don't tell anyone, but Zoe is one of my favorites. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, and then we do have a question. Uh, first shout out to Larry West, Tag from the West. And then um, Kevin Brown wants to know how did the recent fire affect the wines? In 2020, badly. Do you guys yeah. want to tell them or do you want me to? <laughs> Pull the bandaid off. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, well, we don't have a vintage, unfortunately. Of red wine. Of red wine. So, tiny bit of, of white wine, Sauvignon Blanc, and a little bit of Chardonnay. Uh, we were able to bring in house and harvest, but. Having gone through this a little bit in 2017, seeing the effects of what the wildfires could have, we knew that we probably were not gonna be able to make wine at the highest level and to our standards. And so we did uh, a lot of testing. That's where the collaboration came in. We did microferments. We sent grape samples into multiple labs and we ultimately decided that, uh, that it was best not to pick anything, uh, which is very tough because I've never not gone through yeah. Sort of yeah. And, and, yeah. I, and actually, I had some lots that were uh, really low. Like they, the, the grape lab results showed that they might have been okay. And so I brought a few of those in. And after fermenting, uh, we, we could, we could uh, detect smoke and, and chalkiness and ashiness on the palate. And, and, and we just uh, bulked that wine out. We just sold it off and had some of it destroyed. You know, we just can't. Couldn't make wine with it, so yeah, no, no, 2020 red vintage for Plump Jack Kate or Odette. Yeah, but it, you know, it showed. There's a saying in the South that is, "Watch their feet, not their mouths," and it really speaks to our level of commitment to quality. It's not just a tagline that we say; it is, it is what we do. Yeah. Well, I'd like to let's talk a little bit about the differences in these two wines. I mean, they're still relatively young, but I can taste the difference. Uh, in all three, Plump Jack versus uh, Screw Cap versus Cork, Cade. I expected it in Cade faster for some, maybe because it's also a year older. But they're all showing differently. <laughs> Jeff, how would you describe your Screw Cap and Cork in just yeah. a few words? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that uh, with, with the Screw Cap, you always get a little bit more like aromatic freshness. Um, there's a little bit more energy, vibrancy. Um, sometimes, depending on the cork and, and how, how uh, coarse that cork is. Um, it might have a little bit more of, say, the minerality, uh, the graphite, some of those earth tones, um, you know, more of those other, you know, complexities that are also great in the wine, uh, but not as fruit forward or maybe as tight with a little bit less tension. So I find that here, it's very subtle because it's, it's 18 and it hasn't been to bottle for too long, but I would expect as time goes on, that's going to become more and more prevalent. If you happen to get a screw cap, um, if you happen to buy the 18 screw cap, do you think it would benefit from a dump and a decanter? For this particular vintage, yes, yeah. absolutely. How and would I, you describe the 18s? I think, you know, it, something I learned about the 18 vintage as a whole, uh, that patience was the name of the game. That was the name of the game in uh, the growing season throughout, and we just kept waiting, waiting, and waiting, and it was the latest that we'd ever picked um, for any vintage that I've been a part of, uh, going all the way into November. And, um, and luckily we were able to do that with no threats from Mother Nature. And it kind of carried on into the cellar too. So it was actually the first time that I didn't craft a blend upon the first racking. So usually we make and craft that first blend, the first base in um, the first part of uh, winter or, or the first part of the new year, I should say, or uh, spring for that first racking. And I just felt like the wines were a little bit farther behind. They were very primary. And I wanted to get a full sense of the vintage and what we had before jumping to any conclusions. Mm -hmm. And so I, I felt like that's, it's kind of been yeah, the name of the game the entire time, from growing season to what we've seen up until bottling until now. And I actually prefer the 18, even a day, two, sometimes three days after you open it. Mm, so I think it whoa. continues to get better and better with that. Yeah. So I pop the cork, I've come back. Day two, better. Day three, better. Sometimes day four, better. So I think it speaks volumes. That's not to typical, is it? Not typical, no. But I think yeah, that's why decanting, if you yeah. wanted to you know, pop the cork or screw cap and enjoy it that evening, then it would definitely uh, be better to decant. I can't leave a bottle of Odette open that yeah, long. That was pretty tough. <laughs> 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 so, I'll hit it from me in the corner. Like, oh. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think here with the mountain fruit, Danielle? How do you, how do you feel these two compare? 
Well, very similar to what Jeff said. I think the, the screw cap has a little bit more vibrancy and freshness and almost acidity to it. Um, the cork version has started to relax a little bit. Um, and there, some of the more um, secondary tertiary fruit characters are starting to come mm -hmm. in. So a little bit of the cigar and leather and, um, and plum, fresh plums kind yeah. of, where the screw cap just tastes of red currants and cherry um, and the you know the structure is still there so I and I expect actually I, I think for the Cade wines the longer they're in bottle the the dras more drastic the screw cap versus cork becomes yes um, where the the plump jack I think there's a huge difference right now me too I was surprised I was really surprised on the 18s yeah so and do you have a preference screw cap yeah? Yeah. I have a preference. What's your preference? Yes. Uh. <laughs> Both. <laughs> do I have to decide? <clears throat> what actually, do you think? What I actually think? like the cork better right now. Oh, you do? Yeah. Yeah. But it's just, uh, it's just my own personal preference. I feel like, uh, so my, my general philosophy for our wines is uh, buy the cork for now and the screw cap for later. Uh, you know, because uh, if you hold this wine for 20 years and you open a screw cap, it's not going to be corked and it's going to be a little bit fresher. Won't break your heart. Than that, than that, uh, that cork finish. Um, <clears throat> but I feel like today that the, that the cork, at least in, in my glass, I feel like it's a little bit more result. Like it's yeah. a little, like maybe that cork, because the cork has a little air in it. And then yeah. when you squeeze it into the cork, it might release a little bit of air out into the cork. And so you get a little dose of oxygen right at bottling. And so it got a little bit of a jump start, a little head start. And I feel like that uh, made the nose a little more open to me, mm -hmm. a little more aromatic. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the tannin in the screw cap is a little bit edgier today than the, than the cork. But I, but I also know that just from past experience and tasting these wines, uh, when I, if I come back to this wine in five, six years, I'm gonna have a completely different opinion. Totally. I'm gonna, I, like, I, I will appreciate the freshness of the screw cap and the, uh, the tannin of both will be much more similar at that point. They'll kind of balance out. So that structure will be really similar, the, the textures will be similar, but you'll have fresher aromatics. And that's why I like to hold the screw cap and, and drink the cork a little earlier. Uh, but that's, that's my feeling on this wine right now. Um, so. I agree. It's, I agree with what you yeah. said. Yeah. In terms of it's, it's a bit more relatable at this second, this moment, the screw cap, the yeah. cork. We have another question? Yeah, so on this topic, um, first Logan says hi from New York City. Um, he and Mac both would like to know, um, if screw caps are better, why not just bottle all of the wines in screw cap? Because of y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? Yeah. But, I mean, I, I know they want to hear from you, but it's really, it's, it's because it's still not 100% um, accepted, accepted yeah, yeah, by all of our customers, and we want to make sure that we can provide something for both. Yeah, there's, there's, there's still a, a huge perception uh, that screw cap is like equivalent to cheap wine. And by cheap wine, I don't mean inexpensive wine, I mean bad wine. And that's, that's not the case at all. I mean, what makes the wine great is the wine that you put in the bottle. Right. And, uh, and we bottle them under both, and you can taste them both side by side, and you can see that they're both incredible wines and that they have slight differences uh, from one closure to the next, but uh, what the key is that you're putting great wine in the bottle. Uh, we have great sources of fruit. We have, you know, for our, our state vineyards, we have great winemakers. We have great winemaking teams. We have a great staff, uh, and 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 we spare no expense in the making of our wines. We buy the best barrels, uh, and um, and so the what's in the bottle is incredible. And there's just but there's this perception that a screw cap is uh, is low quality, and and so we're we're fighting that along with this. Uh, Tradition, like if you want to call it that, it's like a 200-year-old tradition of putting a cork in a bottle um, <clears throat> and, uh, and pulling the cork out of the bottle, I guess, is, uh, is, is what gets people excited. But yeah. I always find that <clears throat> when, you're, when you're sitting at a table 
and you got a glass full of wine, you've already forgotten about how you opened it. I agree. And you're just enjoying the wine. That's right. You know what you won't forget? If it's ruined, and then it tastes like (laughs) wet cardboard, and your waiter had to bring it back and go get another bottle, and everyone feels uncomfortable, um, let's just skip all that. Exactly. Yeah, we, I, you know, when we did it in 97, uh, it certainly wasn't cheaper to put it under screw cap. <laughs> we had to create a bottle. It's an investment. Yeah. It's a commitment. <laughs> yeah. We made a special bottle. We, we had to get a line in that could put screw caps on. Yeah. Incredible. Well, uh, everyone's talking about bud break in the Napa Valley, which just mm-hmm. pretends the new season of growing uh, it's, is it happening here, Jeff? It's happening. Uh, hopefully you can see it right behind us. Probably not oh, that no. prevalent. <laughs> probably, but, <laughs> you have to have good eyes. They're really good eyes. <laughs> I don't even have that good of eyes. Um, yeah, it's, just, it's exciting. It's the start what, of a new vintage. What does so, it mean? What does bud break actually mean? And why does it get everyone so excited? It's the first stage of the life cycle of the vine. So the vines have been dormant. This is when they wake back up. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's that energy. There's that good vibe. Uh, the buds burst. Um, it's when the leaves of the shoots start to come out and grow, and they grow pretty rapidly at this at this stage. So they they really go from barely being able to uh, see the buds swell to having like decent sized shoots in a relatively short amount of time if the weather is warm, which we have. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's uh, yeah, just it signals the you know the 2021 season has officially begun. Oh, so exciting! Which is, which uh, have you exciting. do you have bud break at Plump Jack? Yeah, I, yeah, we do. And so it, we're just we're just getting started. Uh, we have one block right out front when I came in on Monday I was like whoa like bud break and then I walked around the whole estate and I was like oh it's just that block <laughs> for some reason that one block just started going and everything else is just swelling but it, it but even by now it's uh, uh everything is starting to open up uh and uh yeah we're getting a few inches now on that first block so it does happen fast and it's just it's exciting because it just signals uh, a new beginning yeah. it's a new year uh, we get to start afresh, and uh, who knows what this vintage will hold for us. And um, every vintage is different, and they're all, it's always presents new challenges. And, uh, and, and that's the, one of the exciting parts about making wine, is, is learning how to do it again the next year. Well, one of the things you said, you didn't even realize you said it. I saw a bud break, and then I walked the vineyard. <clears throat> that is not what every winemaker does. And the fact that you're able that you walked your vineyard is the difference between good and great. Danielle, what about you up on Hell Mountain? Surely you haven't started yet, bud break. No, we, we have. On Monday, there's there's like a few little leaves popping up. And then I drove around my to two. Yours is a little bit bigger <laughs> than <laughs> walk at all. Um, you didn't right. walk your hundred? I, I, no, I didn't walk a hundred <laughs> acres. I drove. Um, but no, looking for, for kind of, you know, what was popping out. But Petit Verdot has come out, Malbec has come out, Sauvignon Blanc is out. Um, some of the blocks that are, I would say, on the cooler side haven't quite popped out yet, um, but I'm sure they will by next week. So okay, Your vineyards are on the side of a hill on the mountain, so yes. it's a little different. We're, we're always a little bit behind Plump Jack yeah. and Odette. Um, I would say, you know, sometimes 10 to 14 days on, on that side. Um, we, you know, we have a little bit cooler nights, um, but this time of year, um, above the fog, I think every day this week I've I've come up to Cade, and there's a blanket of pillowy white clouds on the valley floor, and Cade is in the sunshine, wow. which kind of helps us That's catch cool. up cool. to um, Plum Jack and Odette, and sorry, Plum Jack and Odette, uh, which you know helps us throughout the growing season, but. Right now, the biggest threat is frost. Mm-hmm. And so we, we had a chilly night on, uh, let's see, two nights ago it was a little chilly, but not quite to frost level. But this is the concern, especially up on Howe Mountain. Um, we want to protect all of those, um, you know, kind of new leaves that are popping out. We don't want them to frost. And so our vineyard crews are getting alerted anytime there's a potential threat, threat of frost and they're, you know, rising early to turn the frost protection on and keep everything going. So it's kind yeah, of it's a, a hold your breath. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a busy time for vineyard teams out there making sure to, that we 
protect these vineyards and, and keep, uh, keep the crops safe. Yeah. I mean, you think about all the things you have to worry about. People say to me, how's, 21? how's the vintage in 2021? I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, do you, do you get that question? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. of course, yeah. <clears throat> and do you answer it like I do, that nervous? I don't know. No, I think, so <laughs> always compare it to a baseball game. Uh-huh. It's you know it's nine innings like we're like we just had the first pitch yeah like we're right. just yeah. starting right like we're pro- we're not even through the first inning yet yeah so we have yeah. a long ways to yeah, go we have no idea way. how it's going to turn out we're off to a great start yeah first pitch was a strike but we've got a long ways to go do you use the same analogy with baseball uh, no but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will think of one quickly and get back to you. Moment. <laughs> uh, I think it's a great analogy. It is because it's a really long. It's a long game. It is. Yeah, and I, you know, twenty twenty was looking really great until mm-hmm. until right. the end. I thought you were gonna say golf. What, what's, uh, where yeah, did the baseball I, come from? Oh, <laughs> oh that's a question. Uh, I guess. Yeah, you got to get through eighteen holes then. Yeah, right. Speaking of golf, fir- the first drive was great. Yeah, the first drive. Right down, middle of the fairway, <laughs> three hundred yards. Speaking Perfect. of golf. I mean, where is the best place to get a winemaking education? Uh, UC Davis. I might be outnumbered here <laughs> with the wrong crowd. Why is that speaking of golf? <laughs> it's an interesting segue. Because, Jeff, you went to school I originally oh, that's right. because For, of your love of golf, right? Yes. So I was a horticulture major um, into landscape design, um, golf course design, maintenance. And, um, and then I, I found wine and fell in love and, and uh, made the pivot. But uh, yeah, I feel totally outnumbered here. Oh no, oh, oh, Cal Davis. Poly. No, yeah, you're a Cal Poly, Poly yeah, is and Cal Poly is good. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Go Mustangs. Hey, hey, it's better than LSU oh, for winemaking. S- we have a lot <laughs> of other <laughs> Mustangs though within our great winemaking team. Well, you see, you see so. Davis's official mascot is also a Mustang. So is that right? Yeah. Well, you have that in common. What, what's yeah. our audience question? Uh, so Peter and Susan Brusick. Um, would like to know, with this conversation going on about bud break and the vintage, um, how climate change might affect each estate? Good question. Who wants to start? Well, I, I mean, I, it won't, I don't think it'll affect each state, each estate differently. I think it will have similar effects. There's just, uh, we have a huge, a greater variation, I guess, from year to year. Uh, it's still very weather dependent because one year can be really nice and the next year it could be just, just catastrophic, but, uh, in, which we've seen recently. But uh, my, my main concern is the, the more kind of recent weather events that we've been getting in the fall, late summer and early fall. Uh, which are these high winds, uh, really dry air, and high heat. <clears throat> We're getting these heat spikes, uh, 100, 110, 115 degrees sometimes, that, are, that uh, <clears throat> last for a week, two weeks. And I, I grew up in California, and I, in, in my memory, uh, we had heat spikes, of course, but they would be two or three days long, and th- we didn't have 70 mile per hour winds mm-hmm. associated with them. Mm-hmm. And so this is a newer phenomenon, and it's to me like I my first memories are back in 2015, as recent as 2015, uh, so only about six years ago. And uh, since then, we've had uh, several years where we've had these um, these kind of weather events, and those are. Uh, challenging for us because we need to figure out uh, a how to um, grow grapes in this climate in this in this uh, in those events because they can uh, um, really uh, really harm the vines themselves and and also the fruit so we have to work really hard to make changes in the vineyards like uh, adding uh, shade cloth to cool the fruit and to kind of deflect some of the UV um, putting in misters, uh, which puts some humidity in the air, which kind of counteracts some of that, uh, that, 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 that dry air and those winds uh, and the heat. They bring down the temperature just a little bit, the surface temperature around the grapes. And um, that humidity helps so that the vines don't want to pull so much water out of the ground. Uh, so we're using different techniques to try to counteract it. Um, and I think that we would be successful in, in doing that. Uh, but we have this other um, uh, res- other effect, which is the wildfires, right. uh, and we have no way to combat that yet. 
so I think that we could combat this, uh, these events if that wasn't a factor. And unfortunately, it is. And so that's our, our biggest threat right now. Danielle or Jeff, do you have anything to add to that? I think, yeah, I think Aaron nailed it, really. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a lot of what's going on right now. Uh, people are saying, oh, do you have to change varietals? You're going to have to start playing different things. I don't think it's that extreme. What we're battling are, are things like wildflowers. It doesn't matter what varietal. Mm -hmm. with, yeah. a wildflower, with a wildflower. I would, I would also just add um, water that um, we are, California is, is known for droughts. We've experienced it before. Um, but I think climate change has exacerbated it. Yeah. And, um, and it's something that we can utilize science and technology to really change our kind of traditional habits of we water because it's Monday and we're going to water every Monday because that's how we've done it. To really say, no, we're going to water when the vine actually needs it. We're going to water at key critical viticultural moments when the vine needs it, meaning at bloom or at um, bud break or, you know, at veration, whatever those um, steps are in the life of the life cycle of the vine. And, um, you know, really just digging into by block to say mm -hmm. this block um, with this clone, this variety and this rootstock needs water at this moment and this much. And so that's kind of the, the digging into the details and that I'm looking at because water is a precious mm -hmm. resource mm -hmm. and it's not going to be something that all of a sudden appears bountifully in, right. our, in our vineyards um, or in our wells. And so, um, and this year as an example, our reservoir at 13th Vineyard um, is only about 50% full uh, of normal. And so um, that will affect us throughout this growing season. And so we need to change our, our strategies around watering um, to make sure that we can have you know, high quality wines. I think one of the great benefits to the owners that we, that we have is that they allow us to have that attention to detail where we can dig in block by block by block, which is not the least expensive way to do things, but it's the best way to do things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Good. So we're fortunate for that way. Well, I, well, we can't end on this note. Okay. So <laughs> why, don't, um, why don't we talk a little bit about just how the wines, are, are y'all having a good time with the wines? Is it Friday night? Anybody like the wines? Do we have any comments or questions from our from our friends out there? Yes, we do. Um, so Barbara is joining as a club member. Uh, went to see what she had on hand, opened the 2017 Plum Jack Cork, and what a great way to start the weekend. Erin, thank you. Yay for Friday. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. Logan said it's also more environmentally conscious to screw caps, so thumbs up. And um, Larry West wants to know which winery we're broadcasting from. I think he joined a little late. Oh, mm -hmm. from, from the Odetta State, where we have the best internet. <laughs> Austin said, can we get into the winemaker styles? I find it amazing how one group can have three amazingly distinct styles. Well, I, I mean, I think our winemakers share a culture of showcasing place. Is that right? Would you say that? So yeah. Why not, yeah. Why not I think we have similar philosophies. We, we kind of went over this a little bit yeah. uh, earlier, but I think we have similar to winemaking philosophies where we want to showcase our specific places. And we, of course, have different palettes. We have, uh, we, we use different techniques that we think will most benefit our, our specific locations. Uh, for example, Danielle pressing much earlier yeah. than I would press at Plump Jack. You probably press somewhere in the middle, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I, I work a little harder to get extractions, and Danielle's working a lot harder to not get extractions. Right. right? And so we have, we, we have to change our, our process to fit our place. But it's the place that dictates what we do. That's right. And the, the place is what also... Uh, makes each wine unique and gives the wine its underlying characteristics. I think it's the people. Terroir. I think people think Napa is bigger than it is. If you drop Napa um, down into Bordeaux, we take up fifteen percent of Bordeaux. We're just 
We're 4% of California's wine production. We are 30 miles long by five miles wide. That's it. Um, the reason why it's famous is because of the wines that are produced here. And in, in that 30 by five mile area, we have 104 different soil types. We have half the world's soil types. We have uh, temperature variations. We have volcanic soils. We have seafloor that's been pushed up. You know, what we're sitting in here is the midst of a fall from a volcano uh, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I always say, uh, Jeff and Odette and Hal Mount and, and Cade have um, more similar kind of volcanic soils than Plump Jack, which is actually in the middle. Yeah. So the, uh, the, what really makes it different is, is not necessarily that you're doing something different in the cellar, but that Mother Nature did something different a long time ago. Would, right. would you agree with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the wine is made in the vineyard, and 90% of what you're tasting in the glass is, is because of the place where those grapes are grown. I'd love to think that the majority of what you're tasting is my impact, but I don't honestly believe that. Um, there's a few things that you know, guide the direction of a wine. Um, I think one, you know, when you pick it, the day you pick it has a big impact. Um, what happens if you pick it too soon? You, you, there's no putting it back. There's no putting it back. Nope, not <laughs> um, <take> it <laughs> you know, uh, and, and to the blend and kind of some of the components that you can bring together can really change um, the direction of a wine. Um, so especially when you're blending some smaller components together, or if you have a lot of Malbec or Petit Verdot or something, those can really, can really shift the style of the wine. But um, at the end of the day, I think it's just, I, I, I hope people like what I like, because that's what you're tasting right. yeah. in the glass. So I just have to say one thing, though. You say it's not you, but, and then it is, I get that, that it is the vineyard, but, I mean, do you pick a vineyard in a normal fashion? Or do you walk rows with red and green tape? <laughs> well, yes, of course. You, you, Not of course. You can, well, yeah, because you can taste it. If you were walking those rows, you would taste it as well. It's kind of like when you go to the grocery store and you see that, you know, beautiful red basket of strawberries and you bring them home and you're like, oh, it's not ripe yet. If only I had waited one more day. You know, that's, that's the difference of we can all taste the difference between an underripe strawberry and a ripe one. I think we can we can do that, and that's what I'm doing just in the context of grapes over a hundred acres on how So home. just <laughs> in the context of grapes over a hundred acres, you're walking those vineyards, tasting grapes, picking the clusters when they're perfect. That's the that's the goal. To, that's the to, secret to, sauce. To right. walk every row, taste every vine, taste every cluster, and determine is this one cluster ready to pick. That's the goal. And, that's, and, that, yeah. and that part is a winemaker's influence. And, and it's important to remember there's this, that word terroir that people use, uh, that we often use for describing a, a place. Uh, but terroir also includes people. That's right. And people are a part of terroir. It's a grape grower, it's the people in the vineyards, and it's the, the people making the wine as well. Uh, we influence it by the decisions that we make in the vineyards, and we also influence it. Like, it makes a huge impact on the day you pick. You know, uh, if you pick too early or too late um, or right on time, whatever right on time is, it depends on the winemaker. Exactly. Right? And so exactly. that will, that will uh, absolutely influence the final product. And so there's, of course, there's a, a human element. And, um, and like Danielle was saying, we make the wine the way we like the wine and that we want to make the wine. And we're just grateful that everyone else is enjoying it too. Yeah. So that I can keep doing this. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, I mean, Jeff, here, 30 acres, 28 picks. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you're thing. literally I mean, walking a row. <clears throat> right. And, deciding and which. Doing part. the same kind of thing that Danielle does, and it's, it's you know, flagging different sections. And if you can taste the difference, then we can capture that difference. And when you say taste the difference, you mean like just taste the grape? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Tasting the grapes, right. Exactly. Vine by vine, row by row, um, spending a lot of time walking and just getting to know the vineyard and if there are differences. We don't want to pick a long row for average. <clears throat> um, if we can you know, slice and dice that even 10 different ways, then we're, we're going to do that. And that might be a day's difference. It might be a week's difference. 
Uh, but if we have that opportunity to do it, and we do here, the, with the way that we built the winery, we can bring in as little as a half a ton. Right. So we have the opportunity and ability to do that. I just see, because this isn't normal, y'all. They literally walk the row with red tape and green tape. I want to just put it into context and say, okay, pick these three plants, red tape, stop here, start there, stop there. That's, y'all, that is the difference between good and great. It's exceptional. We have a question. Um, so, Brent Patterson, more of a comment. Um, our last tastings were in person at each of your facilities. Now we're celebrating the arrival of our second baby girl by tasting through all of these fantastic wines. Cheers to each of you, Brent and Mallory Patterson, wine club members from North Carolina. Oh, well, congratulations. Oh, congratulations. Cheers. Awesome. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. And then uh, Kevin Brown wants to know if you ever share your fruit with each other. Mm. Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have our estate vineyards that mostly make up our estate and reserve Cabernets, but if there is something that uh, might be a better fit for our adaptation, Cabernet Sauvignon. What's adaptation, Jeff? Adaptation is our, I uh, like to call it our gateway yep. Cabernet Sauvignon into the greater Plum Jack portfolio. So it's made in a a more approachable kind of upfront style. Um, it's an expression of the broader Napa Valley AVA, working with um, our local friends and growers here within the valley. And, um, and so there, at times, maybe certain blocks could be a younger block or it could be, could be something that doesn't, just does not work in Aaron no. and Danielle's yeah. blend. And so if it, um, if it doesn't work in those blends, we want to maximize you know, all of the estate and the reserve lines. And so yeah. we can put them into adaptation. And we won't put it into adaptation if it doesn't work, but right. oftentimes it will work. Yeah. So there could be a little bit of crossover there. Mm -hmm. Didn't you get some Malbec from Jeff at one point? Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've, from both uh, Odette and Cade, I've gotten Malbec for the, our Merlot. Yeah. Uh, and the Malbec is, is great in the Merlot, and since then uh, we've planted Malbec at Plum Jack. Uh, so we have some Malbec that we can use for our Cabernet Sauvignon, mm -hmm. and we do use a lot of it for the Cabernet Sauvignon, mm -hmm. but we also will blend a little bit into the Merlot as well. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, I'm, I'm so glad y'all are here with us today, enjoying the wines. I hope that, um, I hope that you saw a difference in this group cap and the cork. I hope that you have all of them open, actually. That would make for a great weekend. But um, <laughs> what? <laughs> I hope you have some friends over. <laughs> <laughs> some, some good dinner. Um, but is there, is there anything else that y'all want to, that, that I miss that you guys want to mention? At, at, your, at our newest property, Odette? Come visit? Uh, not, yeah, come visit, please. Come <laughs> it's visit. been a while. We're, I've been up at the winery by myself with my team forever, and so we're just getting people back in the door, and we'd love to see you, so come out, come out and visit us. California's come open come June, see June 15th. Bug yeah, break. June 15th. And, well, yeah, I mean, we're, I mean we're, we're starting to open up again for uh, tastings, and, uh, and we, like Jeff was saying, we, we were by ourselves for a really long time. There was n virtually no tasting room staff on, on site. It was just production teams. And, and the other day, people started coming in to the winery, and it was like, it was so exciting to have this new energy come in and just see the people again and talk to people, and, you know, it, it's... I know we're we're just making wine here, but we work hard, and it's yeah. fun to see uh, people just really appreciating our hard work and yeah. what we do. We and, miss y'all, and uh, yeah, we do. We miss you guys, so it's it's fun to see people coming back. I say to these yeah. guys when during harvest when they're working many 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 hours, and uh, it's kind of stressful, and everyone's tired, and often I bring food because that's what we do. Um, but I remind them that that all this work that they're doing. Uh, winds up at someone's celebration, uh, right. that winds up at a wedding or, you know, a great Saturday night. And, uh, and the energy that you guys put forth uh, really goes out into the world. And we, and we are, we're just making wine, but I do believe um, what we're doing makes a difference. Yeah, I, I, I love hearing those stories from people too. Yeah. About weddings and celebrations, anniversaries, birthdays, uh, or, or just uh, a, you know, I've, I've, one, of, one of the more fun uh, stories that I've heard while I was, I think it was, when I was in Florida a couple years ago at a, a, a wine tasting event, uh, a woman came up to me and was like, I never knew I liked wine until oh. I had the 2012 Plump Jack Estate Cab. And 
I will never stop drinking this wine. And like, it was, it was, it was her gateway. Yeah. You know, it got awesome. her into wine and she, she well, loved she's it. Really and that was a fun. Now. That was a, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So that was fun. Yeah. It was, it's fun to hear those stories. Well, I can't tell you how many people I've met that have new babies named Cade. I know. Yeah. I was just going to say that. <laughs> I have met several people that said, I named my son after your winery, after I tasted and came and visited. I was like, great, yay. <laughs> it <laughs> is cool. I yeah. did not name my own son uh, Cade. But, uh, but we but picked I, your name while, while drinking Cade. Yes. We picked his name <laughs> while drinking Cade. <laughs> Well, Kate, Kate is just such a beautiful place and such, it's such a memorable experience. I can see why people have that, that reaction and you know, that personal connection. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so. We have another question? So Barbara just wanted to say thank you so much for offering these sessions. What a great dinner, or what great dinner guests you all are tonight. So we must have you all <laughs> oh, great. Oh, my um, gosh. And then lots of people want to know when the next... What if we're doing this again? Okay, we are going to do this again. I might, let's see. I have a note here. April 23rd at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We're going to talk a little bit about our lead building uh, standards. So both Cade and Odette wineries are lead certified gold. Um, and we're going to speak with the architect and our general manager, John Conover, who's one of the owners who really helped to inspire and drive the idea of building our wineries lead. Think about that. And, what, and Sandra, and what, what is LEAD? LEAD is Leadership <laughs> in Energy and Environmental Design, Erin. Oh, okay. um, it's so funny because it's really an urban idea that was based, you know, Chicago Mercantile Mart is LEAD. So that to think of the audacity of deciding to build this winery, LEAD Gold, on the side of a mountain in the country, insane. So green concrete, we use solar electricity, um, I'm going to wait. I don't want to steal the thunder of, of Juan Carlos. We're going to talk to the architect and the general manager, Danielle Soro, a little bit about what brought those decisions and how he did it. And then on May 7th, Danielle and I are going to judge a cooking contest. Oh, really? Yes. I didn't hear about this one. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to drink your brand new 2020 Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc. Now, listen, y'all. The SB, I tell everyone, it will get you in trouble. <laughs> so be careful. But join us, please. And please come visit. Our tasting rooms are open seven days a week, starting next week. We can uh, dis social distance. We can have you outside. And uh, man, we miss you guys. Come on out and see we us. We do. Come see us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us today.